All right, welcome everybody. Um, as I said, my name is Holly Rippon Butler. I am the Land Policy Director with the National Young Farmers Coalition. I'm very happy to welcome you all to today's webinar. Thank you so much for making the time and for being here. Uh, we wanna give a huge shout out to our partners who have supported us and worked alongside us in bringing this legislation together and um, putting this bill together. And um, I just wanna do a quick housekeeping note. This is a webinar style um, Zoom meeting. So uh, you'll see different panelists and presenters spotlighted, but um, if you have any questions or uh, wanna participate, I invite you to use the Q&A feature in the Zoom call. Um, and we will take a look at those questions. If we have time for a discussion at the end of this call, we'll do that. And um, if we need more time, we've and we have um, a virtual discussion space that we'll open afterwards, where if we didn't get to any questions, we can address them there. And that will just be a space where you can join and we can continue the, the conversation. Um, I also want to make sure to mention if you're in DC uh, to join our, our policy team at uh, the happy hour, the in-person happy hour that they'll be hosting. Um, go to the next slide and I'll give you just a quick overview of what we'll be covering today. Um, I will be turning it over in one minute to our co-executive director, Michelle Hughes, who will give a welcome from the National Young Farmers Coalition. And then we have some videos from our original co-sponsoring members of Congress on the bill. Uh, we will hear from Sarah Bell, a farmer and land advocacy fellow in our network. Um, and then we'll dive into this bill. What are the contents of the Increasing Land Access Security and Opportunities Act? And uh, then hear from Irene and Erin, who are representing organizations that uh, have received some funding from USDA recently to work on land access projects. Um, and here's the information about our virtual discussion and our happy hour um, on the screen. The happy hour will be at Dakota, um, which is hopefully for those of you in DC, that all makes sense. I'm sad that I can't be there with you. But um, Vanessa and Yahira and others on our team will look forward to spending that time together. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, Michelle, for, um, for welcoming us. Thanks, Holly. Hi, everyone. Um, well, firstly, I just also want to extend some gratitude for you making the time to be here with us today. So thank you. Um, for those of you that don't know me or we haven't seen each other in a while, my name is Michelle Hughes, and I serve as co-executive director for the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, I'm excited to be here today for so many reasons, more than I have time to cover in a couple minutes of intro, um, but mostly just excited to show support for Lasso, our marker bill, um, to hear from my fellow speakers on this briefing, Senate on Equitable Land Access. Um, as many of you know and have read on our website and our survey, equitable land access is the foremost challenge for young farmers and is the foundation of many of the issues that we work on. Um, we conducted a survey in 2022 of over 10,000 young farmers, the National Young Farmers Survey, that demonstrated land access continues to be the number one barrier for young people looking to enter into agriculture. So I'm really grateful that we've created a space here to share more about why change to land policy at the federal level is so crucial for our work and for young farmers and what specific changes we can make to USDA programming to combat this ongoing issue. Um, as a member of the USDA Equity Commission, I've spent a good amount of time over the past couple of years, two years, communicating to USDA leadership um, and working with many of my peers on the commission um, just how much the future of agriculture and the future of our industry depends on equitable land access for young farmers. Um, so for those of you that have been following the work of the Equity Commission, you know that land access and its role in the future has been top on the list of our priorities, um, is mentioned in many of the recommendations from the commission um, that has been put forth for a commission leadership and USDA leadership. So I just want to preface this conversation by saying this is like one of the uh, most important issues that we're working on both at the coalition and in the movement more generally with USDA. Um, so I hope today will inspire those of you that haven't yet had an opportunity to join this movement in a different way uh, to consider doing so. 
um, as we all have a pretty big part to play in ensuring the next generation actually has the ability to farm for their communities. Um, while I'm here, I also want to give a particular thank you to the farmers on this briefing who will be sharing their stories with us, Sarah and Tyreen, and to our many supporters that are dedicated to this important issue who are joining us today, including representatives from partner orgs, co-sponsors of the bill, um, congressional and USDA staff, and of course, Chipotle, the sponsor of our One Million Acres campaign. Um, we really wouldn't be able to make this work happen without all of you, so I hope in this virtual space, uh, you can feel just how grateful we are for you being here. Um, so thank you. And I think I will turn it back over to Holly, our gracious host, to share some videos from our co-sponsors. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and I'll, um, we'll go right to it. We have um, four videos to show you all today from our um, Senator Tina Smith, and Representative Bazinski, Representative Nunn, and Representative Courtney. And uh, these are some of the original co-sponsors who helped lead this legislation, and we're so grateful to them. So I will um, turn it over. We have, they're just three short videos, and uh, you'll get to hear directly from them about why this legislation mattered to them and uh, why they partnered together and with us to get this marker bill introduced. Hi, I'm U.S. Senator Tina Smith. So thanks to all of you for your work on the Farm Bill and for your interest in expanding opportunities in agriculture for the next generation of farmers and ranchers. There is so much that we need to accomplish in the Farm Bill, but I'd like to highlight the big opportunity that we have in the bill to support new and emerging farmers, as well as farmers who have historically faced discrimination. This is the goal of my bipartisan legislation, the Increasing Land Access, Security, and Opportunities Act. So we know that the average age of an American farmer is nearing 60 years old, and nearly half of all farmlands will change hands over the next two decades. And we also know that most young farmers, emerging farmers, and farmers of color face steep barriers to buying farmland and getting started. If we don't take action, farming will be out of reach for the next generation of family farmers. The health and vitality of agriculture, rural communities, food security, and our national security is at stake. With this in mind, the USDA launched the Increasing Land Access Capital and Market Access Program in 2022. It's a mouthful, it's LCM for short. It's the only USDA program that is designed to provide flexible support and investment that meets farmers where they are and connects them with what they need to succeed. Our bipartisan bill would permanently authorize and expand this excellent program. The bill would create grants and build partnerships directly with state and tribal governments, farmer-owned cooperatives, lending institutions, and nonprofits. It supports work to strengthen access to capital and markets for folks that have been traditionally underserved by the USDA, like farmers and ranchers and forest owners and people working in high poverty areas. This help might take the form of covering closing costs or down payment assistance or for infrastructure site improvements on farmland or for technical assistance or marketing assistance. The point is to provide a leg up for the next generation of farmers and historically disadvantaged farmers in particular who've traditionally just been left out. And this will make our agriculture and local food systems stronger and more resilient for everyone. I've seen how this can work in my own home state of Minnesota where the Latino Economic Development Center along with the Land Stewardship Project and the Good Acre have been able to work directly with producers to connect them to lending and technical assistance. The USDA's LCM, LCM program works, and with our bill, we can keep that progress going. I'm working hard to make sure the Increasing Land Access, Security, and Opportunities Act is included in the Farm Bill, and I would love to have your help and support moving it forward and getting it done. So thank you so much for your work. Hi, I'm... Hi everyone, I'm Congresswoman Nikki Budzinski, and I'm proud to represent Central and Southern Illinois communities in the 13th Congressional District. With the average age of an American family farmer approaching 60 years old, 
it is critical that we take steps to usher in the next generation of agriculture. The Increasing Land Access Securities and Opportunities Act aims to give new farmers more access to long-term, low-interest loans. I'm proud to be leading the charge on this bipartisan legislation that will help young and beginning farmers gain access to land, markets, and capital. The biggest barriers for new and underserved farmers not to mention by investing in organizations that expand land, capital, and market access for historically underserved farmers. We're also creating a more equitable farming industry for people of all backgrounds. It's time to help the next generation of farmers get off the ground. I look forward to working with my colleagues across the aisle to get this critical legislation over the finish line. Hi, it's Zach Nunn from Iowa. Just 15% of farmers are under the age of 55, and nearly half of all farmland is on the brink of changing hands in the next two decades. We have to support the next generation of farmers as they start out. That's why I'm proud to co-lead the Increased Land and Access Security and Opportunities Act to ensure that new farmers have an on-ramp to access capital and start their own business and continue their family farm. Our goal is to bring the next generation into farming so they can continue to do what they do best, feed and fuel the world. Proud to serve you, proud to farm with you. Hi. Hi everybody, this is Congressman Joe Courtney. I'm speaking to you from my office in the Rayburn building. And uh, again, just wanna say hello as part of your event today in terms of the you know, National Young Farmers Coalition, which uh, I think is one of the most interesting and important voices uh, on Capitol Hill. And um, again, congratulate you in terms of the great work that you're doing, you know, really playing the long game in terms of America's needs for, um, you know, sustainable, uh, healthy uh, and reliable food production. The, um, this is a, a year where hopefully that agenda will move forward with the Farm Bill and, um, you know, the legislation that you helped um, craft and organize uh, the Land Access and Opportunity Act uh, is hopefully going to be um, one of the provisions that we incorporate into the Farm Bill as it moves towards hopefully um, uh, enactment. And uh, again, the arguments that you've made in terms of just uh, the aging of the workforce, the fact that we actually have um, a large eager uh, population in America that is really um, highly skilled and really understands the, the issues of the future in terms of climate change and healthy eating um, and healthy growing um, is uh, really, I think, exactly what um, a, a farm bill reauthorization should, uh, should be about. So I look forward to hearing about, you know, again, the great work that this uh, virtual and in-person convention uh, is able to organize and, and look forward to working again as we kind of hit showtime in terms of the Farm Bill later this year. So have a great conference and uh, thanks for listening. All right, so that concludes our messages from our original bill co-sponsors and uh, we're very grateful to them for taking the time to record those videos for us today. Uh, but now I'm I'm very excited to turn it over to Sarah Bell, who's with us, who will share a bit of her story and help us understand the need and why it's so important um, that we are working on this legislation for the coming Farm Bill. Um, Sarah is a land advocacy fellow with the National Young Farmers Coalition and a recently um, new member of the USDA Advisory Committee on Minority Farmers. Thank you so much for being with us, Sarah, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Holly. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarah Bell, and I live just outside of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I'm a first-generation farmer. I grew up around Philadelphia, um, and growing up, I had no idea what a farmer looked like nor did I think I would ever become one, but um, soon enough, I realized just how important farming and land is to me as a Chinese American. Um, as a mother and active member of my farming community, really all I want is to farm and to have a viable farming business um, as part of a cooperative 
where I have the option to scale up my business if I wish, where I can pay employees a fair and livable wage, where I can feed my community good, healthy, culturally relevant food, where I can regenerate soil and revitalize native ecosystems, and really, most importantly, be an example for other young and new emerging farmers that farming is a career worth having. Um, and sometimes I think, why is this such a difficult goal to have? Why is this a difficult goal to obtain? Um, I have lived in Alabama for the past seven years. I have worked um, on urban farms, sub more suburban farms and more rural farms. Um, mostly I have worked with other first generation farmers or new and beginning farmers. Um, I've worked as a farmer educator for young people interested in agriculture and growing their own food. And what I've seen and what I've encountered myself um, are a lot of barriers for, for emerging farmers, especially historically underserved farmers. Um, and I'm really hopeful that the that this act addresses some of those things. Um, personally, land access and land loss is such a huge barrier. Um, obviously, um, urban growers do not always want to move rurally, um, yet in urban and suburban areas, that is the most difficult land to access for agricultural purposes. Um, I farm on leased land throughout the state. Um, and really my goal and dream is to buy land cooperatively with my other friends who are farmers. Um, but it's it's hard to find. It's hard to find um, agricultural land within, you know, an hour or so of Birmingham where the market access is. And also think about, you know, my family and child care. Um, and also land in rural areas is not being kept in agriculture. Um, and just a lot of historical land loss as well, especially in Alabama. Um, for me, something, another barrier would be sort of the cultural barrier of entering into agriculture. Traditional agriculture is, you know, not exactly a diverse space to enter into. Um, and I think another thing to act um, that, that I see as being like such a positive is this increase in community and like collective support for new and emerging farmers. Um, you know, as I learned to farm many years ago, I have gained the skills, I have gained the knowledge of how to farm, but what I realized was so difficult was navigating like the USDA, um, the USDA programs, how to get a farm number, the FSA loan process, what are all the grants that the NRCS does, you know, is how do I find technical assistance, financial assistance, how do I determine my market access, um, and lastly, just, you know, I think about my, my own journey as a farmer, and there have been few people where I can, few farmers that have been farming where I can say, oh, wow, I, you know, I really like see myself in their career path and how they became a farmer. Um, and I think about young people and the next generation and young people I interact with and, you know, they, they need to see like a vibrant community of farmers um, where they can pay their rent or mortgage and take care of their families and see that that farming is valued and it's worthwhile because it really is. Um, and then just lastly, what I wanted to touch on, um, you know, we hear the average age of farmers is rising and we know land for new farmers is difficult to access. But I think about what happens if we do not address this issue and the consequence of a lack of land access, land retention and land loss is really the loss of culture and the culture of marginalized communities and a loss of empowerment and agency. Um, as I have made farming my career and passion, um, I have realized how important land and agriculture are, not just for farmers, but for all of us. It impacts everybody. Um, how communities take care of land is a direct reflection of our lifestyles, what we eat, 
our clothes, our religion or spirituality, how we gather, um, my traditions, and really so many other facets of, you know, people's cultures. Um, and really, I just see how land and agriculture are directly related to um, empowerment. And so if only a certain kind of person or a corporation has access to land, what happens to my culture, to other people's cultures, and to the many minority and regional cultures that make up our country. And so this, that is sort of the consequence and that's why this is such an urgent and pressing issue for me um, because it really does impact all of us. Um, but thank you everybody so much for having me speak today and listening. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing your story, for sharing your reflections and your wisdom and your words. And I um, think that is really perfect framing for diving into a little bit of what Vanessa and I now will share from our perspective, working on these issues from DC and from the policy um, policy side and thinking about the big picture of what young farmers and ranchers across the country are facing and what role our federal government has to play um, in addressing these challenges. So again, thank you so much, Sarah. And um, we really appreciate you. And uh, every every time you you speak on this issue, it's it's so impactful and important. Um, I would like to invite Vanessa now our, um, from our team at the National Young Farmers Coalition, who is based in DC and leads our government relations work. Uh, Vanessa is going to share a little bit uh, about um, this issue of access to land, and we'll talk about um, some of what we're seeing across the country. Um, I'll share a little bit about the need for this legislation and why we are working on this, and um, and we'll we'll get into some of the bill details. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Vanessa. Thank you, Holly, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I really want to focus and stress in the idea that this is something that we hear from farmers all over the country. Obviously, we have stories like the Sarah's stories and my own story of growing in a small state where land prices were really high. But this is something that we heard through the country across the nation about the need that about the need for land access. And even before we did our 2020 national survey, when we heard that land access was the number one challenge and consistently, and it was even greater for farmers of color, we were working on our 2020 land policy report when we were really identifying trends that make land access harder for the next generation, and at the same time identifying the solutions. And as a coalition, land access has been at the center of our advocacy because the things are only getting worse as our population of farmers keeps aging and the new generation uh, tries to enter farming. We have seen that even with a plethora of resources, we do not have enough access to secure land access. And for us, we really want to focus that it's not only having land access, but it's keeping the land, it's land access and tenure. We really want to stress that land access is the foundation to the work that we do. Is that land access is the foundation of the farmer identity and the issues that drive farmers to work towards public health, their own mental health, climate and conservation practices, and their own equity and principles of why they decide to farm, especially as individuals of color. So for us, it's really important to remember that land is our key issue as a foundation, as a, a coalition, and it's foundational to the work that we do, because we believe that without addressing land access first, we cannot address all the many things that we identify in our national survey and report in their layout in our national farmer agenda, because we believe that is foundational, that is necessary. We need to first address land access, security, and tenure so we can build on and continue transforming the food system so it's representative of all the things and needs that young farmers need to succeed. And that's across supply chains and so keeping our communities fed and our rural communities going. 
at the same time addressing issues related to farmer mental health, food sovereignty, and equity. That's fine. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I will jump in here and share a little bit about um, why we as a coalition launched our One Million Acres for the Future campaign and why we really began to focus um, many years ago in conversations with partners and in our work on this, um, on working towards introducing this marker bill. Um, so, you know, big picture, we were looking at what federal programs exist to address this issue that, as Vanessa shared, we know is the number one issue affecting this next generation of farmers. And there were there are no federal programs, no USDA programs that are really centering land access, that are holistically addressing land access, land retention, and transition. Um, we have many incredible and important programs that um, that address farmer training, conservation, credit, provide funding for outreach, um, you know, address farm farm labor, housing, but um, we're not, you know, we were not seeing a program that was really taking this land access challenge head on. And so that was a lot of when we started to think about building this bill and this legislative text, uh, we felt this had the opportunity to fill a huge gap and center the number one challenge facing this next generation. Um, we also knew that this is a really key moment um, as research from the American Farmland Trust shows nearly half of US farmland is expected to change hands. And we know, you know, over the next few decades, and we know that young farmers are leaving agriculture because of the land access challenge. We can't afford to lose this next generation of farmers. Um, we, you know, understand that at the same time that this land is transitioning, very little of it is going to actually be available to farmers who didn't grow up on a farm. And according to our survey, that's 75% of this next generation didn't grow up with access to land or in a farming family. Um, in 2014, you, the USDA predicted that only 2% of all farms that were changing hands uh, over the coming years would be made available to non-relatives. So, you know, understanding um, how much land is transitioning, how little of it is actually going to be accessible to this next generation of farmers, and the, the overlapping challenges of rising land values and land loss. At the same time that this transition is happening, we're losing agricultural land to development, and land is getting incredibly expensive, especially in relation to farmers' incomes. Um, even just, you know, recently we saw a statistic that um, land values have risen as much as 50% over the last few years, um, and, you know, 20% between 2020 and 2022. So these are numbers that um, farmers cannot compete with. Um, we know anecdotally and through statistics that these numbers and values are being driven by non-farmer purchasers of land. And um, this is the environment that farmers are competing in. Um, we can go to the next slide and uh, talk about some really hopeful action that we saw from USDA that was a really big part of um, as this process of creating this legislation and writing this bill. Um, in August of 2022, uh, USDA announced the Increasing Land Capital and Market Access Program. Uh, this was a $300 million funding opportunity that we saw as a direct response to the collective platform that we had put together through interviews and conversations with partners that asked for a flexible, creative funding source uh, from the federal government that would allow communities to address land access challenges that they were facing in their own regions uh, through the mechanisms and the strategies that they knew would work. Um, this program received incredible community response. FSA received over, they received 164 applications and over two and a half billion in funding requests for that $300 million pool. Um, 100 organizations signed on to a letter uh, with us asking for a deadline extension. 
And the awards were announced in June of 2023. Uh, 50 organizations with projects covering 40 states and territories received some of this funding and are just now beginning their projects. Uh, we'll hear from two of them later in this call. Uh, so all that to say, there's, there's a strong demand, a strong need, and there's strong support for this type of funding that the Increasing Land Access Security and Opportunities Act would implement in the Farm Bill. Um, over 181 organizations have signed on to a letter of support for this legislation, and we're just continuing to build momentum and let Congress know that this is the type of action we want to see in this next Farm Bill. Um, I will talk now about a little bit of details of what is in this bill. And um, this was something you know, we have, as I mentioned at the top of the call, have so much gratitude to our many partners who we work very closely with on writing this bill text. Um, many, many days in Google Docs and on phone calls. And we really wanted it to respond to the needs and the challenges that were out there. Um, we can go to the next slide and I will start by um, talking about the request of funding. We know that you know, sometimes there are really important pieces of uh, legislation and marker bills that are, that are messaging bills that share a message that say what's needed. Um, this bill is a funding request because that is the need. The message is that farmers need, they need financial support to compete to access land, to have security. Uh, there's a funding request of $100 million per year, uh, or $500 million over the five-year uh, cycle of the Farm Bill. And uh, this, you know, we just want to point out is 0.1% of the total five-year projected spending of the 2018 Farm Bill, and 1.7% of the conservation programs that, uh, you know, have an allocation over 10 years from that bill. So we're talking about a relatively small amount of funding, but something that would make a huge difference for farmers in their communities. Um, we, you know, focused on this really deeply on what farmers were telling us they needed. Um, they need this investment from our federal government. Um, and we especially need to support those who have been historically underserved by federal programs in the past. Uh, we're confident that this investment will generate immense returns for taxpayers. And we see it as an insurance policy for all of our other farm bill spending, uh, ensuring that you know if we spend money on conservation programs and other investments, um, this, is the, this is the funding that will help ensure that farmers have that underlying security to keep farming, to stay on the land, and to keep um, continuing the, the stewardship of that land that our other farm bill programs are supporting. Um, and uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, I will talk a little bit about what is actually in the bill and what it does and uh, what we're excited about, about this legislation. So for one, it establishes a stakeholder committee. And I think that's really important because we wanted and we heard really strongly from our partners that the way in which federal funds get out the door is incredibly important and needs to be determined by those in the field who will be receiving them. So there's a funding request in this bill, but there's also um, an the provision that a stakeholder committee will be the ones to work with USDA to determine how funds go out the door. So whether that's a competitive grant program, cooperative agreements, or other mechanisms uh, that are used to get the money out the door, uh, stakeholders would decide. Um, this funding is available to a whole list of, of typical eligible entities such as states, uh, local and territorial governments, tribal organizations. Um, we've also included CDFIs, community development financial institutions that can help create innovative lending programs to address land access, um, and cooperative entities. So farmers that are working together in that collective spirit and um, working with each other, but perhaps not under a 501c3 or other structure, 
could also have a foot in the door to access these funds. Um, the intended beneficiaries are historically underserved farmers, ranchers, and forest owners, um, young and beginning farmers, those living in high poverty areas, farmers who, again, have historically not received the benefits of our taxpayer dollars in our federal programs. Um, the eligible activities is what really sets the bill apart in another way as well, because you'll see the first item on this list is acquiring real property, um, acquiring land. And that's not something that other federal farm bill programs currently support outside of our FSA, our lending programs. Um, and this is talking about providing support for down payments, land remediation, and critically, uh, constructing and improving infrastructure and housing, which are incredibly interconnected challenges with land access for farmers. Um, technical assistance is also included because that goes hand in hand with land access and innovative practices like revolving loan funds. Um, the bill also would include um, addressing heirs property challenges as an eligible activity, which we know is critical uh, to land retention. Um, there is a section of the bill that gives priority as well to projects. And we felt it was really important specifically to call out providing direct financial assistance to the intended beneficiaries. So while we have many important programs that provide training, and there are some aspects of that that could be included in projects supported by this bill, really we wanna make sure that farmers, organizations, entities working on this issue are getting direct financial assistance um, to address land access challenges. Um, I will keep us moving and just want to say that, you know, we find that this is a really unique program. We see it meeting a demand, offering flexible support for community-led solutions, and making sure it's providing that relevant, um, culturally appropriate, and community-minded assistance. Um, some of the outcomes that I want to highlight the vision for what we see, um, and this is in part based on what we're seeing with um, already the funds rolling out from the land capital and market access program. Um, the bill could fund community-led efforts to um, establish creative financial solutions to land access, um, support land banks, um, provide grants, uh, supporting tribal governments and buying land back and making it available to native producers um, and funding organizations uh, to award legal services support to farmers, which is so critical to land access um, and supporting this cooperative ownership and collective land ownership aspect, which, uh, you know, we understand is, is so critical to creating that um, community uh, vitality and viability for the long run. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Tyreen Lewis, who's here with us to speak a bit about um, his organization. Hello? Hey, Haru, go ahead and give us your testimony. I think uh, Hall is having some internet issues. All right. Well, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Tyran Heyru Lewis. Um, Heyru by itself means um, King Liberator. The name of my organization is um, Heyru Urban Farming and Garden. I'm the president of the organization. I'm also the owner of Heyru Urban Farming um, as well. Um, so uh, I'm a farmer. Uh, I'm an underserved farmer. Um, I wasn't always a farmer. Um, here in St. Louis, I was an educator at first, but I got into a former for an important reason. I noticed in my community, it's a lack of um, access and um, a sustainable food in my community. Um, I'm in St. Louis where less than 1% of the food grown in this state is used for human consumption. I'm from, a, I'm from an area where um, uh, most of our produce comes from over 1,200 miles away. I'm from an area where over 850,000 people in the St. Louis metro area don't have sustainable, healthy produce within a half mile of their, of their neighborhood. So that means walking distance. Um, so what, what I, what I do here, I provide that, I provide that, um, that, um, that outcome for that food. Um, and one thing I noticed, um, food is something that everyone can relate to. Um, you know, um, so that that's the connection there. 
Uh, and one thing I noticed, um, the people in my community that um, that do have sustainable uh, grocery stores is, di is different from the suburban counterparts. So, um, for example, within the inner city, we have the same chain of a grocery store that looks totally different. Um, when you get in the city and as you move further and further out in the suburbs, it's a different look. And I wanted to change that. Uh, so I started with just growing food in my backyard. Um, the one thing I noticed uh, when I was growing food in my backyard, um, people start talking to me, right? So um, I even well, went back that up. I seen a vacant lot across the street from my house as well. So, you know, I started looking into it. Like, okay, maybe I grow some food over there. Start growing food. Everyone was talking to me. I mean, people that I was over there for five years, no one said a word to me. But I noticed that's a sense of community as well. Not just eating healthy uh, and giving the access. It's also community uh, motivation, uh, motivated other people to start growing. People start connecting and talking to each other. And I, I just know that sense of community. So I told myself, well, this is something that I, that I should be doing, you know, as a full as a full time scale. So just to make the summary short, I start off with 10,000 square feet and, now, you know, now I'm at um, I had three acres of um, of leasing land. So um, so and I, I had the opportunity to be granted um, a grant from the um, from the FSA for land capital market access grant, which I'm a blessed to receive uh, with this grant. It will allow me to get um, land access, allow other farmers to come out and farm as well, create an incubator system. Um, a training system. Not only are we teaching them how to farm, but we teach them how to make added value product, how to start an um, LLC, how to start a nonprofit, and um, and 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 bring a sense of um, um, I guess um, encouragement to the community that you know, because a lot of times you know the stress of um, not having space, uh, not having enough to feed your family, living in underserved communities, um, like I say, a, a community that I'm from, um, and not only are we letting them um, do an incubator, we actually give them ownership. Right of 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 land, you know, and we we uh we gonna help them out with distribution, um uh, things of that nature. Um, uh, that's something that's very important. Um, and uh, like I, I said before, I am a fifth generational farmer. So even though I grew up in St. Louis, um, I remember my um uh family members when I was younger growing food, planting seeds in me. Um, I, I'm fortunate enough to find out that my great great uncle is from Paris, Texas. Um, he started an all black co-op in 1939 where they per purchased um, tomatoes 20 on 24 acres and sold them. That's unheard of in the South at that time. Uh, from 1950 through 54, um, a, a lot of my family members and uh, they had Negro state fairs back then. And you have your regular regular state fair and they won first, second and third place in multiple categories. So um, it's embedded in me, it's in my blood. It's something I'm really passionate about. Um, it's just uh, just the small things that I'm passionate about too. Just seeing people's faces, you know, you know they know they're eating something healthy. Um, knowing there this, um, you know, there's a way uh, with this grants way for them to to make to make means to make money for me to pay employees. Uh, the main thing I see when I'm dealing with my local farmers is the land. Land is number one. Land is so expensive, and like they mentioned before, um, it's going away in the urban setting. We got a lot of redevelopment going on. And, um, and we're still relying on getting food from other places. And we have this beautiful um, land um, in Missouri itself. So um, I, I really believe um, uh, this is something that can change um, the lives of a lot of people um, and make healthier choices um, to feel um, comfortable and less stressed about how they're going to um, eat a healthy meal, how they're going to support their family uh, if they want to do something that they love. Um, and, and also the, the tag onto that, also back the lasso bill as well, um, uh, because it's a, it's another bill, um, that will help, help out these farmers. And uh, one thing I like about it is, um, it's for collaborative networks could also get this grant instead of having a 501c3. A lot of people don't, um, don't have that, um, that entity set up, um, for a 501c3. So that's another barrier for farmers as well to access land, um, you know, and um, like I said, it's it's really um uh, a very emotional thing to sit here and just think about, you know, um um someone wanting to do something, want access to them, but just can't, right? Um, not not you know, just just not set up for them to uh, to achieve. So um, these these grants are definitely something um that would benefit um the community, your community, and also the state and also the country as a whole. I really believe that. Um. Uh, um, one of the things I like when I think about farming, it brings togetherness, it brings community. Um, you know, it, it takes away that negative stigma, especially with my culture. Um, people always re refer to farming to, to cotton picking, right? To, to, to slavery. But um, it, it's deeper than that. That's something that's in our, um, 
that's that's in our genes. You know, that's something that um that our ancestors did um out before farming, right? I mean, before slavery. So that's something I um I like to do when I go to these um uh, to the schools and talk to the youth. So that's one thing. I, another thing that um I pride myself on is um having an agricultural curriculum. You know, that I go to the schools and reach the youth. I'm big on the youth. You know, you reach them while they're young, right? We got next generation, and it's cool to see these kids' face light up when they see somebody that look like me. I'm not your stereotypical farmer, you know. Uh, what does a farmer look like? A farmer can look like anybody, right? As long as you grow food. And I love to see the inspiration I see on the kids' faces and on uh, the motivation and, you know, and 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 the fields they want to get into, not just uh, farming could be a lot of different avenues. We got a lot of um, AI coming into play and uh, different things for the new generation. So I just love to see that to give them another, um, another option for them to, um, uh, another, uh, I guess, workforce for them to go into. And um and like I say and I believe this this grant is bigger than me. Uh, I know I'm I'm one of the first ones to get it, but uh, I'm like setting a blueprint. I I believe I believe it's my responsibility uh, to show um, those behind me um, the work that I'm doing and show them how it to be done. And I could be that person to guide them along the way and um, and show them uh, what you can do and all the different um, um, options you have. Um, that's why this is um, I believe um, this grant would be something um, special for the upcoming generation. In, in the foreseeable future. Thank you so much, Tyreen. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you being with us and sharing sharing your experience and um, everything that you are looking forward to doing with this funds this funding. Um, I will turn it over now to Aaron, who is with us with the Latino Economic Development Center. Thank you for being here, Aaron. Yeah, thanks for having me, and it's good to be here. Um, <clears throat> my name is Aaron Blythe. I'm the director of agriculture for the Latino Economic Development Center. Oftentimes when I meet new folks, they're like, what's this white guy doing representing the Latino Economic Development Center? Uh, we are Latino-led. Uh, we have about 17, 18 staff, another 10 board members, uh, committee members for our loans. Um, I think about 25 of those folks, um, only two of them are non-Latino, myself and another person. So it's very much a Latino-led organization for the Latino community. And I've got to make sure that I uh, let everyone know that. Um, you know, so for nearly 20 years, LEDCs um, helped out small Latino owned businesses start and expand their businesses throughout Minnesota. Uh, in 2013, uh, we became a certified um, community development financial institution. Uh, so we were able to actually give loans to the community. Um, Last year, we supported about 1,100 clients with their entrepreneurial needs. Um, access to capital continues to be one of the biggest barriers for folks uh, that we work with to start and expand businesses here in Minnesota. In the last five years, LEDC has uh, been able to do about 210, uh, lend to 210 businesses, uh, and that's patient affordable capital that's accounted for about $11 million and has been leveraged for nearly another $15 million for the Latino community. Um, since 2011, uh, we started realizing that about a third of the Latino community in Minnesota lives in rural Minnesota, greater Minnesota. Um, many of those folks are working on farms, working in the meat industry, working on lecherias, dairy farms, um, and are contributing greatly uh, to the overall economic impact of agriculture in our state. And so one of the things we started looking at was how do we create a farm worker to farm owner pipeline? Why can't folks that are working on the farms, living in those communities, actually have power to create their own uh, businesses within those communities um, and to become farmers? So within the agricultural sector, uh, we've been able to, in the last five years, uh, do 48 agricultural loans for about $1.4 million to 34 individual emerging Latino farmers. Uh, we've also distributed about $450,000 in direct grant funds to that community. Um, and I believe this makes us one of the most active CDFIs in the country for agricultural lending. And I think it's a template that can be used for many different communities um, going forward. Uh, in 2023, we received a, um, the land access grant. I always forget the name of the full grant. <laughs> um, for $2.5 million. Uh, this grant is definitely uh, gonna be a game changer for us and for the farmers that we work with. Um, about $1.5 million of that will be loan fund money. Um, so we actually, for the first time in our uh, organization's history, have dedicated uh, money just for lending to farmers. So 
before it was coming from other pools. Um, this money will allow us to um, lower our interest rates. Um, we tend to do the five to 7% interest rates, which in this market's not that high per se, but feels too high to me always. Um, and with this funding, we'll be able to do lending at more like two to 4%, which is a, a game changer as well. Um, some of these loans can become forgivable loans. Um, and some of these loans can be leveraged to uh, create um, more opportunities for more money uh, down the line. Uh, we know that access to capital is a vital aspect of taking a farm from surviving to thriving. We also know that CDFIs have a strong track record across many industries uh, to be able to develop deep relationships within a specific community or a specific geographical location and get those folks access to capital that they just historically have been denied. Um, loans from our CDFI are more flexible, better designed to meet the needs of the small Latino farm borrowers that we're working with than uh, traditional banks and certainly um, FSA programs. Um, we developed innovative underwriting standards to meet the needs of borrowers considered risky by other lenders. Um, and then we work really closely with those uh, farmers to be able to make sure that they're able to pay on time. If they can't pay on time, we can uh, create other pathways to make sure that um, they're staying on their farm and staying um, able to, to grow their business. Um, a typical a farmer that we work with will take about 80 hours of technical assistance to get them to even a $20,000 loan or to a grant, just helping them start their business, think through their financials, think through their markets. Um, and most lenders do not have that sort of capacity or interest in spending that much time with individual folks. Um, and so this is exactly why I think this funding with Lasso is so vital um, that we continue to do this work, um, that the government continues to find ways to connect with innovative uh, organizations like ourselves that are really on the ground, eating in the restaurants of the folks in the community, uh, talking to them in their homes and really understanding uh, culturally how to connect within that, um, those communities, whichever community it is. Uh, two quick things I'd like to highlight is just that um, so we worked with a farmer last year who had a contract for deed uh, on a farm that he needed a balloon payment for. It was a perfect kind of thing, situation for FSA to take on. The local FSA office was excited about it. We connected the farmer. They looked at the numbers and were even more excited about it. But then it turned out that that farmer had an A12 visa, he's El Salvadorian, uh, came because of uh, earthquakes in El Salvador back in 2001, I believe. It's a really messed up, uh, underfunded program and it's been hard for it to essentially he's here legally and will most likely be able to stay for his whole life um, but when we got to that place with FSA it was clear or wasn't clear but there was a question of whether they could actually get lending through FSA it took another month or so of kind of going up the chain to figure out if this person was actually um, eligible for FSA funding uh, and it, honestly, the feedback we got was the ultimate answer was no, but it was also clear that the statute was not remotely clear enough in that, in that situation. And it kind of left us feeling like um, it was up to the whim of whoever was sitting at the right desk when we called. Um, and that didn't feel uh, clear enough to us. And certainly there's other situations like that that I, I'm sure arise throughout the country. And so I think there's an opportunity within this Lasso Act to maybe address some of the statutes. I don't pretend to understand the best way to do that, but I do think it's important because there's a lot of folks with mixed immigration status who want to farm, have the skills to farm, or in the communities where farming is happening, and they need access to capital as well to make, make that work. Um, I'll leave it at that, actually, um, but I'm super excited to hear that this, this um, bill is going forward. Um, and I, I hope you all support it. Thank you so much, Aaron. And now we're going to wrap up. We have just a few minutes left um, and we'll have a couple slides up that will share some information about how we're asking everyone to take action now. Um, we'll also be sharing in the chat some a link to our landing page that has all the information for farmers, for organizations on how you can support 
the Increasing Land Access, Security, and Opportunities Act, how you can let your members of Congress know this is what you want to see in the Farm Bill. And if you are a member of Congress or you work for one, we're asking you to co-sponsor this legislation and help us get it across the finish line. Um, there is now um, also an opportunity to join us in a few minutes for ongoing discussion where everyone will be able to, to speak and we will drop the uh, link for that uh, session in the chat as well. And um, I'll turn it over to Vanessa for just um, a remark or two about where we're at in this farm bill process and why now is such an important time for action on this bill. And um, we'll put up as Vanessa is speaking, a slide about some uh, additional marker bills that our partners are working towards that we're very uh, supportive of and that we think will make a huge difference alongside this legislation that we're talking about today. Um, so thank you all for being here. I'll turn it over to Vanessa. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and staying until the end of the webinar. I just really want to recap that we have been talking about the farm bill for a long time and obviously it feels like it's never going to arrive we don't know what may look like but we do know that we still have more time to educate our members of congress to bring more organizations into this movement and to more people to get excited about this legislative proposal that is last so many other ones listed here so what we the best to our ability we think we may still get a farm bill between march of this year and may just yesterday chairwoman stavano issued a press release saying that She's still here, she's still ready to fight and still ready to pass a farm bill sooner rather than later. Obviously, we know there are many things happening in Congress, so the farm bill gets kicked off to the end of the line, but we want to keep the momentum going. We want to keep educating our members of Congress to let them know that this is something that you are passionate about, something that is needed, and an investment that we cannot miss to make in the next farm bill. So don't think it's too late. Don't think tomorrow will be too late. Don't think next week will be too late. It's never too late to message your members of Congress and letting them know that you care about this, that this is important to you, and that you please request them to uh, sign on as co-sponsors of this critical piece of legislation that is an investment for our communities, for our farmers, and for the future of American agriculture. Thank we want to thank you all for coming, and I'm going to pass it to Holly as, as she tells you more about how to join the conversation. Uh, online, and I hope to see many of you in our happy hour in DC as we celebrate all the progress we have made on uh, putting land access at the center of the conversation during this farm bill with many of you as partners. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Um, all that's left to say is a huge thank you to our speakers and farmers and our members of Congress who contributed to today's briefing. And thank you all for being here, for caring, for all the organizations that have signed our letter of support so far and all the members that have co-sponsored. And please join us, join Vanessa and Yahira and others from our team in person and uh, join myself uh, in the virtual discussion space happening right now uh, using the link that was dropped in the chat or sent to you via email uh, right before the briefing. So just copy that. And then as soon as this ends, you can hop over into that space and thank you all.